Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to this session. Today we will talk about selection of action. So far we have talked about decision making which employs attention and working memory resources and uncertainty or risk among other factors affect decision making. Framing also affects decision making. Framing is how a message is received. So how we present the message, how it is received and how people will behave or act on that message. And then heuristic decisions reduce the effort required in decision making performance. However, heuristic decisions also lead to certain biases. Now thus far we have talked about the most of the parts or most of the processes in the information processing model. So right from the sensory processes to perception, attention, memory and decision making. And after decision has been made or taken to influence the environment or take certain action, then what action should be selected? What are the alternatives available? What action should be selected? So we are toward the end of the information processing model. So after this session, you should be able to describe different reaction time paradigms. Reaction time measures the speed of processing or speed of taking an action and how fast we can respond to a stimulus, for example. When there is an information available in the environment, how fast we can act on that. The required response has to be made. Then uh, you can design experiments uh, to investigate response selection and speed of implementation. Discuss how different factors influence simple and choice reaction time. So broadly speaking, there are two types of reaction times, simple and choice. As the names indicate, in simple reaction time, we just have a single situation, one stimulus to which a response is to be made. In choice reaction time, we have choices. There are alternatives available. We can select a particular action and then we can implement that. Then generally, whenever a speedy performance is shown, there will be some error that will be committed. And there is some kind of a trade-off that has to be understood between speed and accuracy. Then identify different types of human errors that can lead to failures in individual performance. So this accuracy and error are complementary to each other. So as accuracy increases, errors decrease. And therefore, as speed of action increases, the errors also increase. Uh, then estimate human reliability on the basis of system reliability. So we'll look at how the system reliability can be estimated. And from there, how we go over to the human reliability. Just to revisit the SRK model, where we talked about three kinds of behaviors, that is skill-based, knowledge-based, and rule-based. The skill-based behavior are primarily highly automated, they are skilled based behaviors and as we know skills are very proficient performances where a rapid choice of action is important. So skill means just do something. As soon as there is a situation, take an action, do something. No decision is involved, etc. and therefore the speed with which the action can be implemented is very fast. Then there is rule based behavior which is a rapid choice without deliberation because there are certain rules. So it's an if-then kind of situation. So there's a naturalistic decision making, say in medical and aviation decisions, where if the, say, surgery is going on and there is a certain situation, then the rule is to do whatever is to be done. The difference between skill-based and rule-based behavior is that skill-based behaviors are generally demonstrated by experts uh, who have highly, a good amount of training overtraining maybe at times, and rule-based behavior is generally shown by the novices. 
in both situations, reaction time is the appropriate measure of the speed of activity or speed of performance. Then finally, there is the knowledge based behavior where some deliberate, slow and often involved in tasks where there is a good amount of uncertainty and there is no set rule. So, there is a new situation for example, developing a software and here accuracy and error becomes important. So, we look at particularly the reaction time and we look at the reaction time paradigms and see how reaction time paradigms, different reaction time paradigms lead to an understanding of reaction time. So, this lecture primarily uh, deals with skill based actions and that is why we are talking about reaction time. Sometimes a distinction is made between the response time and reaction time. So, normally they say whatever we measure in the laboratory is reaction time, given a situation how fast the respondent can act to that particular situation and in general the uh, more used or more frequently used term is response time. But for our purposes we will use the term reaction time and because that is established and that is established through empirical research etc etc. Then reaction time is the time that elapses between the stimulus onset and response initiation. So, generally the reaction time is used to measure mental processes, how the information flows through the nervous system and what happens to that information at various stages in this flow and therefore, it is also called mental chronometry. Chronometry means measurement of time. So, mental chronometry is the time course of information flow, measurement of that flow through the nervous system and this therefore, speed becomes important. On the basis of reaction time, we can identify these component processes and also we can quantify that is exactly say how much time each component is taking. So, mental chronometry seeks to measure the time course of mental operations and the human nervous system. Mental chronometry provides the basis to relate human thought processes to measurable events in the brain. So, from behavioral studies of reaction time for example, one can relate that reaction time to what is going on in the brain. So, brain processes can also be understood. Uh, there are different reaction time paradigms and uh, basically they quantify the stages involved in a particular cognitive process. So, idea is that we measure a reaction time for certain kind of tasks and then these tasks involve different cognitive processes and then the reaction time is broken down into certain components that will take place in different stages. Generally following techniques are used uh, to measure stages in reaction time. The subtractive technique by Donders, this is a classical technique about 170 years old and the additive factors technique, uh, we have looked at additive factors techniques by Sternberg. So, the difference between the two is that in the destructive technique, we find out reaction time for two different tasks and one of the tasks, the processes involved in one of the tasks are contained or involved in the other task. So, by subtracting the two, we can get that. We will uh, clarify the additive factors technique as we proceed, the meaning, what is the meaning of additive factors. Basically, additive factors means that different stages are influenced by different tasks and if there are certain variables which influence one stage, if that variable, those variables do not affect another stage of processing then we say it is an additive uh, situation. Then we will talk about psychological refractory period paradigm and psychophysiological measures. So, psychophysiological measures will relate those behavioral measures of reaction time to the brain processes and idea in physiological measures is to locate in different places in the brain as to how a particular action, behavioral action is related to which part of the brain, where is it located, how is it controlled by that particular part. So, the Donders method of subtraction involves three kinds of responses, three types of responses, type A response which is a simple reaction time situation, one stimulus one response, reaction B which is choice reaction time and this choice is for the action 
there are alternative actions possible and choice selection is made for one of them. That is why we are referring to selection of action. Then reaction C, complex reaction time. The laboratory studies of reaction time emphasis, emphasize time pressure and accuracy, both because as we discussed earlier, if the speed of response is made faster, then there will be more errors that will be committed. Therefore, the two are interrelated. And therefore, uh, generally by reaction time, we would mean that we would like the respondent to be as fast as possible. So, for example, on a system, if a display indicates a hazardous situation, if there is a signal of that kind, then the operator should take a very fast, quick action and therefore that speed is very, very important. So what is reaction A? It is simple reaction time. There is a single stimulus and a single response. So for example, there may be an experimental study where certain letters are presented on the screen and the respondent is asked to press the space bar as soon as there is a letter presented on the screen. And the instruction is to give a fast response as fast as possible and as accurately as possible. A sprinter starting to run when the starting gun goes off and you know, so normally uh, that is what happens. So uh, you know, the, there is a warning interval and then, then there is the actual to start the uh, response. Then reaction B which is called choice RT. This is called go-go paradigm. Go-go as the term indicates that means there will be different possible responses to different stimuli. So there is a set of stimuli. There is a set of responses, a particular response is associated with a particular stimulus. So if this stimulus comes, make a response this. If this stimulus comes, makes a response this. So that is why it is a go-go kind of paradigm. Uh, making a vocal response, for example, yes or no on seeing a consonant or vowel. So a vocal response can be made. See from the monitor, a consonant appears, say yes and a vowel, say no. Generally, if we want to study how the choice reaction time is influenced by the situation, we should use the same response modality. But if the approach or the objective is to study difference between the modalities, then we can use different modalities for the same uh, uh, kind of situations. Then pressing the corresponding letter on the keyboard on seeing a letter on the monitor. So if on the monitor letter A comes, press the key A, if C comes, press the key C. Then reaction C, uh, which is called complex RT as, and this is also called the go-no-go no go paradigm. And as the name suggests, that means there will be certain situations, but give response to only one of the situations. Do nothing in others. If there is any other situation, do nothing. For example, on a display, the pointer can move in various positions and there can be different indications of the system status. But only when the pointer indicates a certain range that may be uh, risky, dangerous. For example, on a vehicle, there is an indicator which indicates whether the petrol is in the almost empty, whether the petrol or gas tank is almost empty, then that is where a response is to be made. Otherwise, wherever is the pointer, it really does not matter. There will be several point positions that the pointer can take. So pressing the space bar on seeing an uppercase vowel, but doing nothing if there is a lowercase vowel or there is a consonant. So there can be these different situations, but make response to only one. Now this entire presentation about the Donder subtractive technique or method can be represented in a schematic form as indicated here in this pictorial representation. So reaction A, just there is one stimulus, call it S1 and one response R1. So as soon as the stimulus comes up, make the response R. And what we are measuring is only one process or one component process of the entire possible processes that will take place in the total spectrum of the reactions. And this is called response initiation. Just make the response. Stimulus is there, make the response and as fast as possible, etc. Then reaction B, there is a stimulus S1 to which a response R1 is to be made, stimulus S3, etc. to which 
response RC is to be made. Now here, the situation is slightly more complex. It's not complex, it's more choice based. So as soon as the stimulus is presented, first of all, the operator has to understand, discriminate this stimulus with other possible stimuli where discrimination stage is involved. And if now the discrimination has been made, then select a response or choose a response from the given alternative. And finally, response initiation, make the response. So there will be three component processes in the choice reaction time situation. And reaction C is where, you know, just S1 to make S2, S1 make a response R1 and to S2 and S3 do nothing. So there is a stimulus discrimination, but there is no choice because there, is, there are no alternatives as far as responses are concerned and therefore reaction time under the reaction C is SD plus RI. So response selection time can be obtained from here by subtracting reaction C from reaction B and we get the response selection time as RTB minus RTC. So that is how we can uh, come to know the quantified value of different stages. And similarly other combinations can be seen. So what does, so that is why it is called the non subtractive technique. We are subtracting some stage from some other stages. Now, uh, so Donders uh, method reveals uh, three sequentially organized information processes in two stages. One is sensory stage and the other is motor stage. In the sensory stage, the process is stimulus discrimination as soon as the information comes to the sensory. In the motor stage, there is a response choice and response organization, response initiation. So these three stages are there. Now in most, on most systems in real life, what will be involved is simple and choice reaction time. Very rarely will there be a complex reaction time situation, but that can be there. So it is important to understand how the response will be made to a complex situation, where only one response is to be given irrespective of what is the stimulus value. Then uh, the additive technique, Sternberg's additive technique, we have talked about it while talking about attention and perception, where basically Sternberg suggested that the reaction time increases linearly with the memory set size. So certain letters are given as a memory set and the respondent has to search for a particular letter in that list. For example, uh, there can be four letters in the memory list, there can be eight letters in the memory list or there can be 12 letters in the memory list. And the subject's task is to search for D or M. So in, these ex in this example, we have taken M as the particular stimulus. We can take D or M. So basic idea is that uh, search set is smaller and uh, the search set memory set is larger. So the target item, these are called items. So memory set has certain items. And then, uh, so M is, there in the search set, but uh, it is not there in this. So this is called the, a response here will be target present, response to the 4, 8 and 12 memory set size situations will be target present. But response to this where the target letter is not present is the target absent situation and what's been found that this reaction time, there is search time basically because here is, so react, it is the reaction time whether it is search time or whatever, then this is a linear function of the memory set size and uh, Sternberg suggested a serial self-terminating model based on the slopes of the target present and the target absent functions. And we have discussed this while talking about attention and perception. So what stages does the Sternberg additive paradigm suggest? Three additive stages. One is sensory stage. 
it depends on stimulus parameters such as the intensity or clarity of the probe. Uh, so, basically when it, we are saying this is an independent stage, first stage in the entire processing, then only certain variables which affect the stimulus representation, for example, intensity, discrimination, etc., or acuity, for example, these are the variables which will affect the sensory state. Then the comparison stage, it depends on the number of items and the number of items have nothing to do with the sensory state because in the sensory stage there is just that pair of letters, target letters, small. Then there is a response stage. It reflects the difficulty of the specified response. How difficult is the specified response? Okay. So, difficulty can be uh, in, for example, here uh, the target absent is more difficult because reaction time is higher here, etc., etc. So, these three stages are additive. Now, what does it mean that these stages are additive? How can we infer from our reaction time data that these stages are additive? So, obviously, one possibility is that we introduce several variables which can affect reaction time. And then, if there are certain variables which affect only the sensory stage and there are uh, and no other stage and there are some other variables which affect only the comparison stage, for example, memory set size here, then we say that they are additive. And additive also can be graphically represented. So, let us see, uh, uh, go into that detail. So, in a, for example, in a two-factor situation where we take SR compatibility and stimulus discriminability as the two factors. Uh, these are called factorial designs. When we take two factors in a study or three factors in a study, we call it factorial design. The absence of an interaction effect on RT indicates that the factors are affecting different stages and we say that the stages are additive. So, what does it mean that the interaction is absent? We will look at a graphical representation. The presence of an interaction effect indicates that the factors are affecting the same stage. That means the, the processing is non-additive. So, this is just a pictorial representation of the additive and non-additive results. So, suppose we take SR compatibility at two levels, low and high, and then discrimination also at two levels, high discrimination and low discrimination. These are theoretical curves, but just to meet the uh, you know theoretical interpretations because if discriminability high then it should take lesser time. Similarly, if SR compatibility high it should take lesser time and therefore, the curves are plotted in that particular orientation. Now, here uh, there are two functions one for low discriminability and the other for high discriminability and compatibility is taken as the independent variable on the x axis and we find that the two functions are parallel to each other. The low discriminability and high discriminability functions are parallel to each other. And it is this parallelness of the two functions that indicates that the effects are additive. In this situation where, with, uh, where we find that the two functions are not parallel, uh, they will interact somewhere, then we say there is non-additivity or there is an interaction effect. Now, this parallel uh, can be uh, you know even even the, even that if we get functions of that kind even that will be considered as parallel as long as the distance between the two curves remain the same across different points. Because normally in a factorial design the independent variable will be some ordinal or nominal level of measurement it will not be interval or ratio level. So, if we just interchange these two positions, then we will get a straight line function. So, it really does not matter, you know, all we have done is that we have taken three levels and so on, uh, then the situation will be slightly different. Now, in statistical analysis, we talk about the effect size. So, what is the effect size? What is the total effect when two variables are present and what will be the effect when one variable is present? So, normally in a two factor 
factorial denial situation, the a particular mean for a given combination of discriminability in low uh, and, and uh, compatibility can be represented as overall mean plus the effect of the first variable which we can take compatibility plus the effect of the second variable and we do not find any product here. All we find is the sum of the two effects. Therefore, this if we can represent this situation by uh, that equation, then we say there is additivity. But if there is an extra term because of the product of the two effects, then we say there is an interaction effect. So, interaction effect can also be understood mathematically in terms of a product term being present in the equation. Now, some tasks that reveal psychological factors that influence reaction time, several factors influence reaction time are Shepard and Matzler mental rotation task, for example. We have discussed this and what we found was that if we have two objects, say let us say same object presented in different orientations. So, they are presented in different orientation and the task is to judge whether the two objects are similar or not. So, these are similar, but these are not similar objects shape, let us say. Uh, I am taking a simple shape, but one can have you know, random shapes or objects or whatever. And what um, Shepard and Masler show was that reaction time is a function of the relative orientation between these two objects. And so, if you go from 0 to 180 to 360, that is what will happen. So, it is almost a symmetrical curve. So, whether we take clockwise or anti-clockwise direction and they did their studies in several ways and this was a consistent finding across m most of the uh, stimuli and also for the entire range of orientation that is possible. So, the highest time is taken when uh, the one of the uh, representation of the same object is upside down as compared to is inverted as compared to the original representation. So, Shepard and Masler mental rotation task in indicates that reaction time will depend upon what is the relative orientation between the stimuli. So, now, all these can be used as some guidelines to design displays. How should we present the information? We do not expect the subject to rotate uh, like that. Uh, what we want to do the subject is to get the information as fast as possible, so that if an uh, emergency action is to be taken, then that can be taken with a good speed. Then sentence picture verification task. We are also we investigated, for example, whether a sentence is, is true or false of a picture. And we showed that uh, the true affirmative sentences are fastest to be processed and false affirmative sentences are the slowest, provided the picture is presented before the sentence. If the sentence is presented before the picture, then it will be a different situation. So, basic idea is that center, sentence picture verification task also reveals that reaction time will depend upon how the information is presented. So, generally uh, one should avoid presenting uh, information in, in negative forms. A simple affirmative statement, short, all that we discussed, short message should be short and it should be in an affirmative form, so that the linguistic processing can be speeded up and the idea is the information can be acquired very fast by the operator. So, center and picture verification task also indicates that the sentences should be present in the affirmative form fastest for processing. Then models of memory, for example, Collins and Quillian model, where we showed that there is a hierarchy of nodes and uh, there are links between those nodes. So, for example, animal can be animal can be a bird or a fish, and then we took different kinds of fish. So, we can take shark and salmon and 
then there are certain properties attached. The most general properties are attached at the top level, at the superordinate category level. And then specific properties for fish are here and very specific instances because these are instances of that particular category. Then what has been found is that to verify that a, a salmon is a fish or a salmon is an animal, the reaction time that will be taken by the two different verification of the two statements will be dependent on the number of links that has to be processed. So a, a canary, a, a, a salmon is a fish will be faster than a salmon is an animal. And similarly, if the properties are attached, then where are the properties attached and all that. So that is how you know the uh, reaction time will get influenced by the level, hierarchical level in the network from where exactly the information is being picked up in a superordinate, subordinate category kind of relationships. Then Posner's letter matching task also indicated that there will be differences in reaction time. In the letter matching task, Posner took three conditions. One is a physical match, for example, AA. So this is physical match, physical match, and then AA, that is sound match or phonological match. So phonological match, and then AE that is rule match. That is the two letters which are presented are vowels. So do they have the same shape? Do they have the same name? So phonological means name, name match. And are the two letters vowels? And then the subject has to make a judgment and say uh, what is correct. And then uh, it's been found that the reaction time goes up. And in fact, this processing, going from the physical match to the name match to the rule match, this is an automatic process. And all the processes will start at the same point, say as soon as this is presented, physical match will be over here, and the name match will be over here, and the rule match will take. So the reaction time will be the largest in case of the rule match situation. So letter matching tasks. In fact, letter matching tasks can be extended to matching of other kinds. It can be uh, non, um, you know, phonetic or non-linguistic representations, where just physical match can be, so geometrical shapes, for example, can be compared. Now, then stimulus modality. In which modality is the stimulus presented? Say, visual modality is about 40 milliseconds slower as compared to the auditory modality. Now that is because the information transmission rate is higher in the auditory channel as compared to the visual channel. So that is why if we present an auditory stimulus, uh, 130 millisecond, and in the foveal region, 170 millisecond, that is the kind of reaction time. Now this is an interesting finding because as we saw earlier, the iconic memory is shorter, which is about one second duration, as compared to the echoic memory which is about three seconds, which lasts for about three seconds. So auditory modality seems to be more robust. Now this is an important information, robust in terms of the quickness with which an auditory stimulus can be responded to and also the duration for which the echo will con continue and therefore the you know, loss of memory will be slower, the response will be faster and this can be a very useful way to present information in situations, for example, in uh, wherever there is a sudden decompression, uh, where you know loss of uh, blood may flow from the brain out, and there may be a situation where the operator uh, may be unconscious at times, but then the auditory stimulus can. So there may be a blindness uh, or etc. etc. Because of which the uh, visual modality will not be. Uh, really available to the operator, but auditory modality will still be available. So, now, so stimulus intensity is another variable which affects 
and what's been found is that the reaction time decreases, simple reaction time decreases with stimulus intensity. And there is a two stage process, one is aggregation. That is the sensory receptor accumulates information that is made available in the visual field or in the auditory field. And then there is a lower criterion, so remember the, uh, the signal detectability theory where we talked about the criterion. So by lowering the criterion, more responses can be made and this will be faster in that situation. So these are the two stage, stages which are involved and again these stages will be independent. <coughs> then temporal uncertainty. How uncertain or the time dimension is the stimulus? So this is, this refers to the uncertainty we know is related to the definiteness, the probability with which a stimulus will occur. So degree of predictability when the stimulus will occur is what measures temporal uncertainty and generally warning intervals become important. In many sports, for example, we know that warning intervals are there. In hockey, for example, the referee may say goalie ready, striker ready. So basic idea is that just to give them the warning that now the actual stimulus has come up because within a very short period of a few seconds, the striker should either make the goal or it will be out of, the, the ball will be out of game. So, um, you know, so warning intervals are very important. And what has been found is that short and constant warning intervals, they lead to short reaction times and they can even be zero at fixed reaction time of about 500 milliseconds. So it seems that 500 milliseconds gives the kind of time that will be required to prepare the system to respond. And therefore, if that preparedness is there, then as soon as the stimulus to which a response is to be made appears, comes up, the response will be made. Now, if the warning interval is long or varying, then it will be long RT. Then there is expectancy. Expect expectancy means as the time passes, warning interval becomes longer. The respondent expects that the signal will now come. So now this is very interesting. Expectancy and temporal uncertainty seem to be, you know, very interestingly related to each other. And so if we look at the uh, varying warning intervals and look at individual responses there, then short warning intervals lead to long reaction times. Because there is a lower expectancy, one does not expect the actual signal to come immediately after the warning is presented. About 500 milliseconds, as we said, is the most optimum time where it will become zero. Uh, on both sides, it will increase. And long warning intervals will lead to shorter response times or reaction times. This is because of the increased expectancy for the stimulus to come up. So as the warning interval becomes longer, the respondent expects that now the stimulus will come up. Then there are some variables which influence choice reaction time. The amount of information to be processed, the speed accuracy trade-off, stimulus discriminability, the repetition effect, response factors, practice, executive control, and SR compatibility. Executive control and SR compatibility we have discussed already, so we will not look at them. But let us look at the other factors. Now, the amount of information we have discussed in the information theory, where uh, with the help of the Hicks-Hyman's law, we found that time to respond to a situation where the number of alternatives changes is a function of the amount of information which is defined as based on the logarithm of the probability of the, of the stimulus condition. And then, uh, so uh, H is the information, amount of information, and RT is a linear function of that information, where information is defined by this formula. So we have looked at that. So the amount of information to be processed, so the more the number of alternatives, for example, uh, more will be the reaction time to make the appropriate response. Then speed accuracy trade-off. Performance accuracy decreases with speed and therefore what is found is that as 
uh, the reaction time increases, the accuracy will also increase, errors will reduce. Now, this gives a very interesting situation that is, uh, should we, for example, in certain situations, should we force individuals to make faster response? And up to what level can one go? So, here we can see that if uh, the reaction time changes from here to here, then accuracy can increase from almost 50 percent to uh, about this level. So, accuracy will increase to a good amount, to a good amount. But for very, if we want a large change in accuracy here, we will need a very large reaction time. So, it really does not help. You know, that means uh, some experts suggest that let the, let there be some errors which individuals comment. For example, in typing. So, in typing a document, for example, uh, we can, should we force the typist to type error free, an error free document, then the reaction time will increase at a very fast rate and therefore, uh, there should be some optimum level that we should decide based on what is the relationship between the two. Then this is the importance of speed accuracy trade off. For example, we can compare two different systems to find out whether one system is better than the other. Now, just measuring whether one or saying whether one system is better than the other on the basis of the speed with which a task is performed, relative speeds with which the task is, same task is performed by the two systems. Uh, can we make a final decision? So, what is suggested is that we should look at both the speed as well as accuracy. And so, we should plot the functions for the relationship between speed and accuracy. And suppose for the system A, we get this function and for system B, we get this function. Then, if we select this point, if we stress accuracy, then A is a better system because A is reaching almost there. The accuracy of A is higher. And so, but here uh, we see that if we stress speed, then speed of B is higher. And so, so B is better on speed, but A is better on accuracy. So, therefore, one has to uh, find out exactly, you know, which particular uh, the trade off one has to find out. Then, stimulus discriminability, longer RT for less discriminable stimuli. For example, uh, between 2 and 6, the discriminability is very high, but if the same digits occur in larger numbers, then discriminability here becomes low. So, to say whether the two numbers are the same, it will be faster for 2 and 6 and slower for the 5 digit numbers. Now, generally when these experiments are done, the reading time is controlled. Okay. So, that reading time does not get influenced by, uh, reading time does not influence the reaction time to comparison as we have already seen that it is possible to identify those stages and by subtraction or by additive method, we can find out exactly how much time the respondent will take in a, for a particular stage. Then practice increases the information transmission rate. It is reflected, for example, in decrease in the slope of the Hick-Hyman law. As practice increases, the slope of the Hick-Hyman function will decrease. It will become faster for experts and for those who are very highly trained. Then response factors, uh, lengthened reaction time with increased confusability between two responses. So, if uh, the two fingers of the same hand are used to make two different responses uh, by, for example, pressing two different keys on the keyboard, then there is a confusability. But if two, dif two fingers of different hands are used, then the confusability is reduced. So, one can compare those reaction times and show that 
because of confusability, the reaction time will be more in this situation as compared to this situation. The increasing RT with the complexity of the response, longer response initiation time in typing a longer string of letters, for example. So as the words become longer, we have already seen also earlier in language processing and communication, for example, longer words are slower to process and they are rare, uh, they are, uh, you know, they take time, etc., etc. Uh, we saw uh, the various principles, for example, Shannon Pano principle we saw. Then repetition effect, if the same stimulus reappears in sequence and the same response is to be repeated, then the response to the second stimulus, which is repeated stimulus, will be faster. Similarly, if a response has to be repeated, the response will be faster. So whether a stimulus is repeated or a response is repeated, the response in the second case will be faster as compared to the first case. Repetition effect can be enhanced by increasing the number of SR alternatives, decreasing SR compatibility, and shortening the interval between each response and stimulus. So these three factors can influence the repetition effect. Then psychological refractory period paradigm. When two or more stimuli or tasks appear in sequential order, the response to the second is delayed because the first stimulus is still being processed. So now this is at the cognitive level where perception or memory processes are important, decision making is important. Refractory period can be there also for the sensory processes. For example, if the retina receives some information, then the cones may be activated, for example. So they are in, in a state of heightened activation. And to receive further information or next stimulus, the cones must deactivate themselves so that their energy level is or their activation level is such that they can pick up the new information. So refractory period exists for almost all processes, for sensory processes, for cognitive processes where perception is important and decision making is important. And that is because in a single channel model of information processing, say attention, selective attention we have talked about for example. In a single channel model, if the resources are completely allocated to processing some information which were came earlier to the system, then the new information cannot be processed. So it will either be lying in a buffer in some form or it will be eliminated. So this psychological refractory period can be represented pictorially in the following way. So suppose uh, there are two tasks. Normally, uh, we talk about refractory period in terms of tasks. For example, in the stimulus response models, Donders paradigm or whatever, or even a choice reaction time model, uh, there will be two tasks uh, respond to stimulus S1 or respond to stimulus S2, or the task may be, for example, driving and uh, also at the same time solving a mental problem, etc., etc., mathematical problem, uh, say orally, manually, not doing manually, but orally. So uh, when the, so suppose the time is flowing in that direction, then the first task is presented at that point of time. And as soon as the task is presented, the processing of the task will start and therefore reaction time should be counted from there. And a perceptual, so immediately a perceptual analysis is done. So perceptual analysis would mean uh, stimulus identification, categorization, based on which certain response will be selected, based on which some decision will be taken, which response to select, and finally that response would be made. So these are the stages involved. Say perceptual analysis of the task, so it lasts, let's say, up to this point. Then response selection or a decision, that will take some time. And then response processing, where a response is made. So
So, these three stages are involved let us say in processing the task. Now, suppose the second task is presented when the perceptual processing of the first task is still in progress. This time gap is called stimulus onset asynchrony and so stimulus onset asynchronicity is defined as the time gap between the presentation of the two tasks or two stimuli or two situations and this is also called the inter stimulus interval. So, inter stimulus interval or stimulus onset, onset will uh, influence the processing of the second task and here the perceptual analysis uh, will start when you know the response uh, decision is being taken for the first task. But then unless that decision has been taken because now the memory system is uh, now loaded with processing of the first task, the, there will be a waiting time when nothing will be done to that information as far as response selection or decision is to be made. So, after the response decision has been made for the first task, the response selection and decision will start for the second task and then a response will be made. So, reaction time will uh, become longer because reaction time should again be measured from the time the perceptual analysis is over here. Uh, even the waiting time will be a part of that. So, this period the slack indicates the time it will take for the central processor where active processing of information is taking place to come back to the original situation. So, this is how uh, we can represent the relationship between ISI and RT2 as predicted by the single channel theory and uh, one can see that if the inter stimulus interval is short the reaction time to the second task will be longer if it is at a moderate level it will be less and then after that it is uh, you know so that is the cutoff where you know beyond which it does not matter where we present the second stimulus or second task. So, if the st stimulus onset asynchronicity is larger than that value then the RT2 will be controlled at that level. Then there are certain psychophysiological paradigms because of the advancements you know it has been possible for example, micro electrodes are the electrodes which can be uh, you know micro electrodes are very minute so we will not go into that detail, but they can pick up information or activation in specific single cells. So, from the single neural cells the information can be picked up. Then evoke potential where uh, potentials are picked up from the scalp by connecting certain electrode and electroencephalography and neuroimaging. We will talk about these techniques when we go to the workload mental workload for example, uh, but here and then positive positron emission tomography and functional magnetic resonance imaging. These are certain techniques the other psychophysiological paradigms. Now, a simple task was designed by the hand and uh, where the subjects were asked to decide whether the presented digit is above or below 5 and the hand used the Arabic letters and he suggested that there are 4 stages encoding obtaining the identity of the number for example, making a comparison against the stored information or representation of the digit 5, selecting a response and checking the output. So, a digit was given for memory and then the test digit was or the target was above or below 5 okay. and these 4 stages were selected and how these stages are additive that is what Dehan suggested. So, basically let us take this simple task where 3 variables are involved task is judged by the represented digit is greater or less than the given number for example, 5 variables are notation Arabic digit versus spelled out digit. So, this is the Arabic digit for 6 and this is the spelled out and then 
distance closer or farther in sequence from 5. 6 is closer to 5, 9 is farther away from 5. Then responding hand, whether it was left hand or right hand. So, what hand found was that they, there are uh, you know this, this kind of finding we have already discussed that if the functions are parallel then there is an additivity and here we find that these functions are parallel. So, basically what is being suggested is that notation, distance or those processes are encoding, making comparison, selecting a response and checking the output for error these are additive. And the uh, pictorial representation is very clear. For example, uh, it suggests that the spelled numbers take more time than the Arabic digits and uh, left hand takes more time than the uh, right hand, etc., etc. So, all these can be interpreted. And then these were related to various brain processes, the, the, the regions of the brain where this information is available. The regions represented correspond to those showing effects of notation used for the numbers. So, Arabic digits are uh, these pink ones. <coughs> Arabic, Arabic digits were processed here, activation of the brain cells in this region. And Arabic uh, spelled numbers where they were in the hashed position, the, the comparison is in terms of the orange. So, this is comparison and then etcetera, etcetera. And these are the reaction times for different processes. So, we can see that the reaction time is increasing in that order. And movement here means whether it was the right hand or the left hand. So, uh, the basic idea behind psychophysiological measures is to relate those stages which are obtained from the behavioral measures, say reaction time to the brain processes or to locate them in the brain processes. So, today uh, what we have talked about generally is the reaction time paradigms and how action selection goes on. Then uh, there are certain errors which are committed and uh, in terms of various types of errors some models have been suggested about which we will talk in the next session. Thank you very much for today. Thank you.